Maria's doctor said her kidney function was stable at 35%. Yet two years later, she was facing dialysis. She felt fine, no symptoms, no warning sign, just a routine lab that changed everything. Here's what I did to change her outcome. Today's advanced medical management can reduce your relative risk of kidney failure by up to 40%, even when lifestyle changes are not enough. Welcome back to the channel, everyone. I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi, board-certified nephrologist and obesity medicine specialist. This is part five of six in our Kidney Protection Masterclass. Now, if you missed parts one through four, watch those first for the complete foundation. Now, let's start off with a couple of things we're going to cover. SGLT2 inhibitor, that's sodium glucose-linked transporter 2 inhibitors. They can reduce kidney failure risk by up to 40% inhibitors or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors can cut kidney events by up to 40 percent as well this is about making sure you understand cutting edge medications that can absolutely change your outcome so today we're going to cover three essential areas first breakthrough medications the sglt2s sodium glucose transporter inhibitors ace inhibitors or angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors and arbs angiotensin receptor blockers. These protect kidney function. Second, we're going to manage key complications like anemia and what are those important steps you need to know. And finally, we'll end with safety protocols and monitoring strategies. All right, so let's dive in with chapter one, which is all about medications that can cut kidney failure risk by up to 40%. SGLT2 inhibitors, they're really a breakthrough game changer in terms of what they can do. Now, remember, these are sodium glucose linked transporter 2 inhibitors, and these are medications that block a specific protein in your kidney. Originally, they were developed for diabetes, but they provide profound kidney protection. And this is seen even in patients without diabetes. But here's what most doctors don't realize yet, and that is that these medications still protect the kidneys irrespective of what the blood sugar levels show. And what the evidence shows is quite remarkable. So kidney failure risk is reduced by 30 to 40%. Heart-related death or cardiovascular mortality, there's a 17% reduction and all-cause death or all-cause mortality gets reduced by 15%. Now, when you look at the mechanism, remember, think of your kidneys like coffee filters. They're processing thousands of cups of coffee per day. And so high pressure, it damages these filters. And what do SGLT2 inhibitors do? Well, they act like a pressure relief valve. And some examples are names like dapagliflozin, which is Farsiga, about 10 milligrams per day is the dosage. There's empagliflozin or Jardians, usually also started around 10 milligrams per day, daily, but dosages can differ depending on what your doctor says. Now, some of the important safety notes with SGLT2s to know is when you first start them, there may be a temporary kidney function dip. This is normal. It's also how we know things are working. And with these medications, you might notice that there's some increased urination. In other words, you might feel like you have to go to the restroom more often. But once again, this will also settle out. And then finally, there is a small risk of genital infections or even urinary tract infections. So now let's go on to the next section, which is ACE inhibitors and ARBs. ACE inhibitors stand for angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors. They block the enzyme that makes blood vessels tighten. ARBs are angiotensin receptor blockers and they block the same system but just at a slightly different point. Now, both have been around for decades. Both have been protecting kidneys for decades. And what are the benefits? Well, kidney events are reduced by up to 40%. Heart events or cardiovascular events are reduced by 20 to 25%. Protein spillage is also significantly decreased. One of my patients, David, was worried about his creatinine increasing 25% on an ACE inhibitor. This is often normal and it indicates the medication is working. ARBs provide similar benefits, 
and they can have some pure side effects. For example, there is no dry cough like some of the ACE inhibitors can cause. Then there is the GLP-1 agonist. Now, typically people know them for diabetes and for weight loss. GLP-1 agonists are glucagon-like peptide 1 receptor agonists. And for patients who have both kidney disease and diabetes, think of these as traffic cops for blood sugar and inflammation. What are the benefits? They can lower kidney outcomes or kidney events by 17 to 24%. They can reduce heart events by 13 to 14%. In fact, the study that showed this, the FLOW trial, was stopped early because of the fact that there was such dramatic kidney protection. So what are some options? There are medicines like semaglutide or ozempic. It's given on a weekly basis. Now we also have dual agents, which are GLP-1 with GIP combined, and those are names such as terzepatide, which goes by brand name Zepbound or Manjaro. Now, remember, when it comes to the FROL trial, the data showed that this was only in patients with both diabetes and kidney disease. In other words, with kidney disease alone, we're still waiting for more data to come out. So, so far, if you're finding this helpful, please share this with someone who has diabetes and kidney disease so that they understand the power of these medications. Now let's get into some additive protection. And the additive protection you can get simply by combining these medications. For example, you can take SGLT2 inhibitors and add them alongside an ACE inhibitor or ARB. And so the model effects suggest that there can be up to a 55% risk reduction with combination therapy for kidney outcomes. And this is a fundamental shift to combination therapy. So if you're already on these medications, especially a combination, like an ACE inhibitor, lisinopril, an allopril, and an SGLT2 inhibitor, let me know in the comments below. All right, now let's get into the hidden complications. So the first one really is anemia, and anemia is so much more than fatigue. Anemia forces your heart to work way harder than it should. It accelerates kidney damage and increases death risk. One of my patients, Jennifer, her hemoglobin was 8.5 and normal is above 12. And as always, just so you know, I always change the patient's names and any identifying information so that there is no sort of identifying features there. Now, in terms of what happened with Jennifer in this case was once we started treatment, her kidneys returned and we were also able to slow down the drop in her kidney function. So why does this happen? Well, as you have kidney disease, kidneys, they produce a hormone called erythropoietin, which tells the bones to make red blood cells. As your kidney function declines, production of this hormone declines. So what are the treatment options? Well, we give you this hormone. So there are epotin alpha injections. There are oral pills that are now on the market, like Daprodustat, and of course, in addition to epoetin and pills, the most important part is this. The fundamental building blocks of red blood cells is iron. So we have to ensure that the iron stores are good in order for any of these erythropoietin stimulating agents to work. And what's the target? We aim for a hemoglobin between 10 to 11 because there is a risk for things like blood clot if you use too high of a dose or get the hemoglobin too high. Next is bone disease. Now, bone disease is truly a hidden killer. So kidney disease, as you know, it disrupts calcium and phosphorus balance. And this causes calcium deposits inside blood vessels. The more calcium you have depositing in your blood vessels, the dramatically higher incidence of heart attacks. And then same thing for phosphorus. Controlling phosphorus is critical and calcium and phosphate can bind and precipitate together. So what are phosphate binders? Well, there are several. They're calcium-based and then they're non-calcium-based like Sevelomer. Non-calcium-based are preferred and Sevelomer has been shown to reduce mortality by up to 40% in dialysis patients. And the advantage of Sevelimer is because it is non-calcium based, it's not adding calcium to your system. Then of course, there's active vitamin D. And what this helps is this will balance bone health safely. And it 
makes sense because oral vitamin D is converted by your kidneys into the active form. And when you don't have good kidney function, you need to take the active vitamin D form to ensure your bone health is good. As kidney disease advances, there's also metabolic acidosis and acid building up inside your blood. It actually accelerates kidney damage. So what's a treatment? Well, sodium bicarbonate, baking soda, can slow the decline of kidney function by up to 43% in studies. And the doses can range between 10 milligrams to 10 milligrams twice daily. But as you know, on this channel, I recommend a whole food, plant-predominant diet because plant-based diets are alkaline and they can reduce the acid. Versus meat-based diet, especially red meat, are very acidic and they will destroy the kidneys faster. Now, let's get into some everyday dangers you want to be aware of. So first is avoiding painkillers like NSAIDs. NSAIDs are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. They are biggest everyday threat. And they include names like ibuprofen or Advil, naproxen or Aleve, diclofenac or Voltaren. And when you start to look at this, you'll see that especially if you have anything like dehydration, somebody has severe diarrhea. One of my patients was on regular ibuprofen and had essentially gastroenteritis. And as a result of it, when we checked his blood test, they had gone down by 40% kidney function in a matter of just a couple of days. Now, fortunately, with hydration, stopping the pain medications, the NSAIDs, he was able to recover just fine. So what's a safer option? There's Tylenol. You can use it for pain. The other part that you want to know about is contrast dye. So whenever you have imaging and your doctor says, it's a CT scan or an MRI with contrast, you want to know, is the contrast necessary? Sometimes it is. And if it absolutely needs to be done, you want to make sure you are hydrated before the contrast and you get hydrated after. Now, you can do it yourself, but in patients who have significant kidney disease already, we will give them IV fluids before and after contrast to give them the best shot and making sure the kidneys are okay. The other part of this is making sure if there are any medicines that could potentially reduce the blood flow to the kidneys, you hold those before going and getting the contrast, and then you resume them one or two days after, depending on what your doctor says. Now, the final piece to this really is water balance. This is the hardest thing for people to understand. As your kidney disease worsens, Believe it or not, some people, they feel more thirsty and it's hard because we're trying to limit them, especially when they're on dialysis because of the sodium in the dialysis fluid, patients get very thirsty after dialysis. Now, general recommendations are in early kidney disease, you're looking for about 1.5 to 2 liters daily of fluids. As you get to advanced disease, we may need to restrict it to about a liter to a liter and a half. With dialysis patients, it's very important to listen to your doctor because sometimes we have to limit you to about a liter a day, and that's very difficult. But the biggest thing is to understand the warning signs of overload. What are they? Shortness of breath, leg swelling, rapid weight gain. And to know this, you want to do monitoring of your weights. If you have advanced kidney disease, do check your weight daily. The other stuff just to be aware of is if you start any new medications, remember your doctor may advise you to get monthly labs for the first couple of months just to make sure they're safe. And after that, they may end up doing quarterly or four to six months labs, depending on how you're doing. Then with blood pressure targets, the big stuff is you're aiming for less than 130 over 80. And in some cases, your doctor may even be stricter than that, depending on things to go less than 120 over 8. Home monitoring is crucial. And remember, if you're on blood pressure medications, if they're once a day, taking them in the evening can actually give you better results sometimes than taking it in the morning. Now, when should you really make sure you're having a conversation with your doctor? If you're noticing that your EGFR or your kidney function is declining more than about three points per year, we want to figure out why. 
And the other thing that's really important is if your protein in the urine is not going down or God forbid is increasing, we absolutely need you to talk to a kidney specialist. And of course, if you're somebody who has kidney function or EGFR below 45, do recommend that you talk to a nephrologist. Now, if you can talk to them earlier, that's great too. But definitely below 45, you want to talk to a kidney dog. So let's sort of bring all of this together and summarize what we've talked about today. One, today's medication breakthroughs are really a revolution in kidney care. I have seen that in my own practice where I've been able to stabilize so many patients. The key medications that we're using are names like SGLT2 inhibitors, ACE inhibitors, ARBs, and the most important takeaway was that a combination approach, say ACE inhibitors plus SGLT2, in studies showed that it had up to a 55% risk reduction in kidney outcomes. Then we talked about essential safety. Avoid NSAIDs, Motrin, ibuprofen, etc. Make sure you're getting adequate fluids for your CKD stage and make sure that you are regularly monitoring your blood work, your blood pressure, and aim for a whole food plant predominant diet. So bottom line here, when you see that you're following these things and you're seeing your kidney doctor regularly, you're going to find that you're setting yourself up for success. But what happens when kidney function declines despite all of these things? Well, we're in part six, we're going to cover living well with advanced kidney disease. So we'll take a look at dialysis, transplant options. But the goal here, once again, is to remember there's always hope. And my goal is to help you obtain not just longer life, but to get the most life out of the years that you do have. I'm Dr. Sean Hashmi. I truly believe you deserve your fullest life at every stage. Please, if you found this helpful, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, hit that share button. And I always end with the same messages. Always express kindness and gratitude to others and to yourself by taking care of your health. Thank you so much. I'll see you next time.